And now today's featured speaker is Bentley University Senior Lecturer, Karen Sabinico. Karen is a Senior Lecturer and the GB215 Coordinator in the Management Department at Bentley. She teaches human behavior and organizations to undergraduates and leading effective work teams to graduate students. Prior to joining the faculty, she served as an Associate Dean and Director of the Center for Executive and Professional Education at Bentley. She's also a leadership and career coach, as well as a certified yoga instructor. And regardless of whether she is coaching individuals, teaching yoga, or facilitating courses, workshops, and seminars, Karen motivates others to strengthen their skills and reach their goals, which is why we hope you're here today. So without further ado, please join me in virtually welcoming Professor Karen Sabinico. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. And thank you, Bethany, for all the help that you've provided in getting these programs started and I'm excited to be the first one this year. So welcome everyone. As I was looking over the lists, I was excited to recognize some last names. And I think it's because I either have had or will have soon in another week, some of your children and heaven help me. I think there may be a couple of people on here that I actually had as students yourself. So thank you so much for joining us today. One of the things that, uh, that Emily just said is that I do think it would be helpful if you can have something to write with. There'll be a couple of, I wouldn't call them exercises, but things that you'll want to jot down visually as we go through today's program. And so it would be helpful if, helpful if you have that um, there with you now. So this is sort of what it, what it means to kind of be in the present. As you know, the, the title of today is about how to be in all ways. And in order to do that, here are some tips because what happens in the next hour really necessitates us to be in the moment with the learning, as I say to my students. So let go of everything that you've done today so far since waking up and try to let go of everything that you know that's still on that list, everything that's left undone that sometimes can elevate that level of stress when we think about it. Staying in the present really means taking a, your mind away from the what's next. And doing that through meditation is a wonderful practice, but even doing that while you're in a learning session like today is going to be something that will be helpful for you. Bringing your mind back to the present when you find yourself distracted. As we know in this Zoom environment, it's really easy <laughs> to have things happen that distract us, even things that are beyond our control, let alone those things that we might self find as, as distractions. And as, as I say to my students, learning is really in the present. It's really about uh, applying a concept today, a strategy, one thing that you can take away from today's hour to apply to your personal or your professional life. That's the goal. And we all know what it's like to go to a seminar, take a course, be in a session and walk away saying, well, that was interesting, but I really don't know what I'm gonna do with it. The goal today is to apply a concept and there will be several that you will be able to do. So again, welcome to, um, to all of you. One of the things I was uh, chatting with Emily and Bethany before we began that I say to my yoga students, the hardest part of yoga is really rolling out the mat. So the fact that you got here uh, means that you really are eager to learn something and really have sort of the new year be a new you. Our agenda for today, we will be talking about brain types and we'll also be talking about work styles. Both of these things are things that I teach in my courses undergraduate and graduate courses, because my teaching is team-based and people who work in teams need to understand themselves and need to understand others in order to work more cohesively, in order to play in the sandbox better, um, if you think about our childhoods. And so we'll talk about those two things as well as looking at what the values are that help guide your life, thinking about your own life and how you spend your time and what changes you might want to think about making in that wheel, what we call the wheel of life. And then lastly, locking in the learning, making what you understand about today's session, 
applicable to your own life and locked in to your own life as opposed to something that was nice to think about for an hour and then forgotten. So that's the point um, and all of that in an hour. So we're gonna start talking about brain types and brain types really are the way in which we approach things that we do, not necessarily work. And it might sound overly simplistic. It's not meant to be psychology or psychiatry in that aspect of the brain, but it's really about how we organize our thoughts and our actions. And there are four dominant brain styles brain types. What I would suggest that you do is as you read through what I'll be showing you on the screen, jot down the type that you think describes you best. And if you want to, just for fun, think about the people that you live with, because we've been spending a lot of time with them if we do share our house with anyone. Think about the people that you live with and how these types might apply to them. So first and foremost, yourself, Secondarily, people that you live with. If you are living alone, people that you work with. Anyone that you are interacting with. Family members who might not be under the same roof. That's also a way to kind of relate the learning to yourself. So here we go. Brain type number one. Brain type number one is you really enjoy being organized. You are planning a lot. You're really conscientious about thinking to the future. You implement a lot of those plans consistently. You are self-disciplined, maintaining order in all of your environment, really important to you. And you are what we would call a natural administrator because of all those other things above that, the other three bullets. So if brain type number one seems to describe you, write that down, brain type number one. There are three others and you might wanna see them all before you decide. And yes, the question always comes up when I do this, can you be more than one? Yes, you can have a little bit of all three, but you'll probably notice that you have one that, is, that tends to be more dominant. Brain type number two. Brain type number two is, you are emotional, you communicate, you are empathetic, you operate on a basis of feelings, compassion. And one of the ways that you learn is by communicating both sides of that, listening and sharing your own thoughts. And again, in the environment that we've all found ourselves in, that can be really difficult when we're not interacting with people the way we normally did. But brain type number two relies on this. You also enjoy working with others. Group interaction is really something that brings you energy. And personal growth guides your life. You're always thinking about how you can improve. What is it that you're learning? Brain type number two looks at life this way, through this lens not through the order and discipline that brain type number one does, but more through the feeling and compassion that brain type number two does. So write down number two if you think that describes you. Brain type number three, you like to wear different hats. You explore new possibilities. You can take an idea, conceptualize it, and really think through in your own imagination how that idea might be implemented. You're really good at that. And abstract ideas can sometimes be the basis of a really engaging conversation that you have with other people. You also tend to be fun loving and having fun in whatever way you describe it is a really important aspect of what's important to you. How your brain fuels itself is through fun. Not as much through the compassion and empathy of brain type two, or the order and discipline of brain type one. So write down three if you think it describes you. And then brain type four, you are rational, you're realistic, you are fact-based, logical. Usually brain type number four has strong technical skills. You tend to be much more task-oriented, action-oriented. You're very efficient. And whatever you set out to accomplish, you want to achieve. 
your goals, your output need to be in sync. Very important for brain type number four. So those are the four. Here's sort of a summary and a label that will help you relate to the numbers. So brain type number one, maintaining, organizing, being planned, being self-disciplined. Brain type number two, harmonizing, emotional, compassionate. Brain type number three, innovating, really fun loving, but being able to conceptualize ideas an explorer and brain type number four, prioritizing. Rational, logical, efficient, systematic is another word to describe brain type number four. So as you think through these four, and as I said earlier, as you think of yourself, as you think of people that you live with, people that you know, family members, people that you work with, an amusing way to describe this and kind of drive it home that I've used with many people is think about your closet. And I know if you were all off on mute, or not on mute right now, you'd all be laughing, but think about your closet for a moment and think about the two extremes. And these are really extremes, but think about how extreme they can possibly be. If you are a maintainer, if you're brain type number one, your closet may resemble more type A. Might not be as extreme as that, but typically organized, coordinated in some way, maybe winter clothes separated from summer clothes, maybe colors grouped together, types of clothes grouped together, all facing the same way, all on the same kind of hanger, really disciplined and maintained not just on day one, but no matter when you walk in, that's the way it looks. If you are a harmonizer, brain type number two, perhaps not as extreme as picture B, but certainly you might have some clothes hung up, others might not be. For you, that isn't as important as people. And so having a system like that isn't necessarily going to be one that A, you'd have any value for or really feel like you'd wanna maintain it. Brain type number three, the innovator. Your clothes might be according to how much you like them. Which ones are the ones you always go to and wanna grab because they're your favorite. And those are the things that you will have quickly at your disposal, the others not so much. So it's based on, again, your feelings and that sense of fun loving and that sense of wanting to react to what you own based on how it makes you feel. And then the last prioritizing. So I always use this as an example. Uh, my husband comes up a lot in my classes when I talk about things like this. He has a system where he wants his shirts and his pants to be rotated through in a way that he feels that he wears them equally. I call it the FIFO method of closet organization. It's the first in, first out method. So if you look at closet A, whatever comes up first in the queue is the shirt he will grab with the pants that come up. And I always, have difficulty trying to figure out how he maintains that. He seems to. It's a prioritization of where that drives that sense of system and efficiency for brain type number four. So as we look at this, and as we start to hone in on what we think our brain type is, we want to recognize the fact that every single one of these has challenges and opportunities. They can work for us and they can slow us down, no matter which one. And we all go into this and into the work styles that we'll be talking about in a moment, in many ways thinking ours is the best and not realizing that there are others, that there are other ways that brains work besides our own. And so the challenges of the maintaining, and think about this if you feel that that is your style, you may feel that you are maintaining everything, that your constant need to be the crisis manager, to be the administrator can get to be overwhelming because you then don't have the downtime for fun. 
And so as a result, those opportunities for looking at this style, this brain type and saying, what might I change? It's a question of saying, what do I need to let go of? How can I fit in, and we'll get to this in the wheel of life before the day, before the hour is up, how can I fit in the things that I know are important, but now I don't because I'm in that maintaining mode. So those are the kind of yin and yang of the uh, maintaining style. And then as we move to the harmonizing style, the challenges can be getting kind of sidetracked feeling that you are always the one listening and not sharing as much. And so because you are empathetic and because you are such a good listener, you may feel that you don't get enough airtime. And as a result of that, creating those opportunities where you really feel that you can be in the reciprocal conversation is really important. It's one of those times when you don't wanna hang out with people that drain you, you wanna hang out with people that energize you. And usually that means a reciprocal kind of conversation. And then when you look at innovating, the challenges are sometimes being difficult, finding it difficult to stay in the here and now. It's that, as I earlier said earlier, focusing on what's next, as opposed to saying, let me just take a moment to be here now and to recognize what I'm learning now, for example. And the change in that is trying to create that balance between fun and work. There are people in life whose brain type says work first, play later. And there are people whose brain type says play now, work later. And it's trying to balance those out that allow us to take this innovating, fun-loving brain type that we might have and create a little more balance. And then the last one, the prioritizing, the challenges are some of your systems, like what I described about my husband, some of your systems may not make sense to other people. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them. It's just that your brain sees it a certain way and optimizes it a certain way, whereas others might not. However, that doesn't mean that you can't delegate, that not all systems of efficiency have to be done by you. And therefore that opportunity for change is recognizing the tolerance that you might need that others aren't as system oriented as you are. They don't need to be as clutter free as you do. And if you are sharing space with someone who can tolerate clutter more than you, it's a question of, again, finding that balance and recognizing the reasons for it. So those are the four. And what I want you to be thinking about now is having a conversation, and we would break out rooms momentarily, having a conversation based on what you notice about your brain type. You've seen what four of them are. What do you notice about it, either at work or at home? How does it seem to help you? And how might it work against you? So any of these topics, you're only gonna have five minutes and this screen will not be shown in the breakout session. So just think about what do you notice? How does it work for you? How does it work against you? And, um, and Bethany's gonna move you into breakout rooms now for five minutes. So welcome back. I I know that that was a very brief time, but I'm hoping that you had a chance to verbalize as well as listen to what people say about their brain types and recognizing how vast they are. Um, Emily and Bethany and I were talking while you were in breakout rooms, and in many cases, you can identify with more than one of those brain types. And sometimes it depends on what hat you have on at the time, whether it is your at work hat or your at home hat, you may find that there's a slight difference. As we move now to talk about work styles, you will start to see a correlation between brain type work styles and then the values and wheel of life that we'll do before we conclude today. So again, in work styles, there are four. And I'm going to be showing you a description. There's actually an assessment that you can take for both of these that certainly takes some time and it perhaps is a little bit more 
accurate in, the, in rather than sort of self-assessing. I'm gonna be providing Emily and Bethany with a bibliography of materials in case anyone is interested. But as you look at this, the work style is really specific to how you approach a task. And nowhere is this more important than when I'm teaching undergraduate and graduate students who are then going to be working as a team and tr with people they've never met, trying to figure out how they each can contribute to the, the task at hand and the work that they'll be doing for the semester. So again, decide which one best describes you. And on that piece of paper, if you've been tracking someone else in your life or work, uh, you can certainly make some guesses about them as well. So work style number one is someone who has very high standards and usually has a strong attention to detail. And we don't all have that, but those who do approach a task looking for accuracy, looking for the details, tend to be in work style number one, really high standards. I have students who, when they join a team, will say to their teammates, I want an A. Not everybody on the team might want to work that hard. And it's trying to understand that difference, that work style of high standards. Work style number two, thriving on variety, shifting from one task to another, feeling like your strength comes from juggling multiple things simultaneously, juggling multiple priorities. That is a style. And work style number one might find it hard to understand work style number two. You may see yourself in both, all is possible, but work style number two tends to be those people who really like to have a lot of plates spinning in the air, juggling a lot of balls at the same time. Work style number three is relying on tight turnaround times to get you motivated. You get energy when the deadline gets closer. You don't get energy when it is a ways out there and when the due date is down the road a bit. And that energy increases as you get closer to that deadline. And work style number four is being creative, being full of ideas, a person who is such a quick thinker that you love to initiate new ventures. You've always got something going. There's always something new that you're thinking about and that you're working on. And that's a work style. It's a way of approaching a task. Think about anything that you do with other people as a team that has the goal of accomplishing something. And the people who are on that team with you and you have very different styles of approaching it. And just like we did with brain types, we're gonna label them. So here we go. Work style number one, we'll call the perfectionist. We know sometimes that that can be misinterpreted as a negative thing as well as a compliment. Both can be true, but high standards and a passion for detail. Work style number two, we'll call the hopper thriving on variety, juggling multiple tasks. Work style number three, the cliffhanger. I'm sure you thought I was gonna say procrastinator because it is a common word that's used. It tends to be a little bit negative and getting energy when the deadline gets closer can be a good thing. Sometimes it can be seen as more negative than it really is on a team. And then last, the big picture thinker the person who is creative with lots of ideas. And so as we look at these, write down which one you think you are. If you're tracking someone else that you work with, live with, family member, write that down as well. As we look at these, just like we did with brain type, there is a way to say each of these brings a challenge. It has a positive and potentially a negative impact on how we approach work. The challenges are, as a perfectionist, never having time to do things as well as you think they should be done and always thinking that you are better off doing it yourself. And students who join teams initially, as mine will be doing next week, those who are the perfectionists feel it is very difficult to delegate. And it's also very difficult to trust. And so the opportunities for change as a perfectionist are, what are 
your top two priorities. What are the things you really want to focus on? And maybe other things don't have to be quite so perfect. Doing first things first, and then building that trust, recognizing that others who may have high standards, they may not be through the roof as much as yours are, but still can do the work well. If you are a hopper, the challenges become getting things done, getting easily distracted so that it's hard to feel like you're really finishing everything. And so the opportunity for change then is setting three or four things. So you'll have enough to juggle between, but establishing times that you can focus. Again, being in the present with the things that are important to you more than the perfectionist needs, but certainly things that are important to you and establishing those kind of interruption free zones. And then for the cliffhanger, cliffhangers really do believe and I get this from students all the time when they're submitting papers at two o'clock in the morning that they do their best work the day before it's due in the wee hours of the night. And that may be true, but the problem becomes then, especially if you're working on a team that others might be relying on you. So creating those now and later lists, establishing an interim deadline that sets you up for partial completion so that you feel like you're moving towards that final due date and still getting some energy to work on it is going to be helpful. Even having a personal reward system when you finish a certain amount of work will allow you to feel like you're staying on track. Those who are perfectionists on the team find it hard to work with cliffhangers. Those that are cliffhangers on the team can't understand why perfectionists want to start it right now when it's not due for four weeks. So there's that, again, that difference in how you approach work. And last but not least is the big picture thinker. These are the people who are great at ideas, but might not be able to implement them, have a lot of plans that don't really reach completion. And sometimes having very little patience for the details, because if there's a lot to cover, you can see big picture thinkers anxiety going up because attention to detail is not their style, not their strength. It's much more about the generating of ideas at the beginning. So the challenge and opportunity for change becomes don't make every project bigger than it needs to be, but also delegate to those that you know really will be good at the follow through because that might not be what you're good at. And if you start to think about how you work with others and the balance you're trying to create, it's all about understanding yourself, understanding others, so that you each bring your strength, your brain type, your work style, and you're doing things that maximize those strengths. That's really kind of one of the takeaways from today's, from today's piece. And so as you start to think about this, understanding yourself and understanding your others is asking yourself these questions. What have you learned about your brain type, about your work style that helps you understand your own behavior better? Just think about that for a minute. What is it that you've learned in the brief time we've been together so far that allows you to say, huh, now I know why I do it that way. Now I know why I think that way. And then the next thing to be thinking about is what have you learned about someone that you live with or you work with that helps you understand that person's behavior better? I always kid with my students and say that when my husband and I got married, before we said I do, we probably should have taken the brain type and the work style assessment in order to figure out how we really are different because the differences can cause disagreement. And what we want to do is understand where that's coming from, where the behavior is coming from. If you're living at home with children, how they organize their space might be different from how you organize your space. And it might have a lot to do with brain type and work style. So think about that because it's going to relate to what we talk about before we conclude today. So the next piece, we have two more things to cover. The next piece is really about values. And in my GB215 course, we teach values a lot. I always tell the students what's important to me so that they understand why I am 
teaching a certain way. And so values are things that we hold to be really important to us. They are the foundation of who we are. And they help us stay true to ourselves and they help us guide our life. Values are not something that you wake up one morning and wish you would change. So you might wake up and say, boy, I wish I wasn't quite so strong a perfectionist because it kind of drives me crazy. Or I wish I wasn't so much of a cliffhanger because I feel like it's not helping in my work situation. Values are things that you own and you know why they're important to you. So what I'd like you to do is to look at this list. There are many on here. As you read either across or down, across the rows or down the column, find three. What three pop out for you off this slide that you can say, yep, that's important to me. That's a value. That's something that I know is a part of what guides my life. So just think about that for a moment and jot down what you think is important. When I look at this list myself, I know that my three are orderliness, self-discipline and getting things done. And in the brief time that Emily and Bethany and I have known each other, they could probably have chosen those for me too. Usually our values are pretty apparent because they are what guide our lives. So now that you've found three that describe you and you've written them down, we're gonna move into breakout rooms again. I'd like you to choose one of the three that you wrote down and in a breakout room, and Emily's in charge, uh, Bethany's in charge of this, so it might be with the same people, she might mix you up, but what does this value say about who you are? How does it show up for you at work? How does it show up for you in your personal life? What made you choose that one out of the three? And you may have seen five on that list, but what makes you choose that one? So again, we're gonna give you just five minutes to move into breakout room and have a conversation about the value. So we, what we're going to be doing now, and I hope you feel as, you, as though you again had a chance to verbalize and listen to how people are um, interacting and verbalizing their values. Because one of the things that I say to my students, and I think it's true for all of us as humans, is being able to put into words what's important to us as values is a great way of introducing ourselves. And when someone, what I say to my students, when, when an interviewer says, tell me something about yourself, I want them to lead with their strengths and lead with their values and lead with what's important to them because it makes them unique and different. And so we are all that way. We all have, when you look at that whole list of values, we all have different values that are important to us. What we're going to do now is move to the last aspect of today's session, and that is something that I call the wheel of life. And I use this a lot in my coaching sessions with clients. And this is, again, a reason why you needed a piece of paper. Draw a circle on your piece of paper and divide it into eight sections, similar to a pizza pie. So divide it in half and in quarters and then in eighths. And so you have eight equal sections in that circle, just like a pizza pie. And then what I'd like you to do is to label each section. So each piece of your pie, each segment of your wheel is going to have one of these in it. And you'll see there are eight on this list. So in one section, label it career, then family and friends. The third one label significant other romance. The fourth, fun and recreation. This can be on in, in, in any order on any of the pieces, as long as each piece, each of the eight pieces is labeled one of these. And then health, money, personal growth, physical environment. So you want to have eight pieces in that circle. Each one of these has a different label to it. And then as you look at this circle, think about the center of the wheel where all the pieces come together as number one and think about the rim the external circle itself as 10. One represents not being very satisfied at all 
and 10 is very satisfied. So if you were very satisfied with all eight of those aspects of your life, your circle or your wheel of life would just would look exactly like the circle that you first drew. The chances of that being true are probably slim. So what you want to do now is put a dot in the center of each piece of pizza in each triangular section, put a dot somewhere either close to the rim because it's a 10 and you're pretty satisfied or close to the center because it's a one and you're not very satisfied at all with your level of satisfaction for that particular aspect of your life. So you look at all eight sections, put a dot in the section representing very satisfied near the end, near the outside rim, not very satisfied near the center, anywhere in between. Once you've put a dot in each of those eight sections, then you wanna connect your dots. Just like that game we played when we were kids, connect the dots. And now you have a new outer edge. It might not look very circular, but you have a new outer edge. Exercise. This is okay. I think someone maybe has come off mute, but not necessarily intentionally. So I'm just going to give you a moment to finish that and take a look at it. And what that should help you see are, as we go back to this slide again, are the areas that you really feel pretty good about and feel pretty satisfied with that you probably wouldn't want to make a change to. However, as you start to look at your outer edge, your connection of the dots, what is that new wheel? What does it look like? Does it look pretty bumpy? Are you satisfied equally across all those pieces of the pie? Does, is there something about reallocating your priorities and where you spend your time that needs to have more balance? Now, keep in mind, you might have a one in physical environment. And that might be okay with you. You might not have the environment that you love, but the other parts of the pie are more important. So just because you're down near the center with a one doesn't necessarily mean you need change. That's really up to you. It's to look at these things and say, wow, now that I've really looked at them, I can see that I'm not really spending as much time or satisfied as much with my own health, with my own sort of how much time I spend with exercise or eating healthy or, what, or meditating, whatever it might be. Or you might look at this and say, boy, and again, post COVID, pre COVID, we have different ways of looking at this, but I'm not able to spend as much time with my family, with my friends, and therefore, when I can, I wanna make sure I put some energy and time into that. So all of this exercise, the wheel of life is really to look at what are the areas that I am very satisfied with and what are the areas that I think I need to put more time and attention to. And then last but not least is making that change is now that you know something about brain type, you know something about work styles, you know something about your values, you probably already knew that, but again, reinforcing that, and you've looked at your wheel of life. What is a change that you really can commit to making? Because as I said at the very beginning of the hour, you can take seminars and courses and sessions and feel like wasn't that interesting and you turn off your computer or walk out the door and it's gone. Even when you felt excited about it in the moment, 
And so before you leave today, think about, well, what's one thing, what's one concept that I might want to keep in the forefront of my mind that I might want to make a commitment to? And how might I accomplish that? Even if that's just being more tolerant of the person you live with, because now you know what it is that makes their behavior the way it is, that's certainly a change and something to be thinking about as you start to kind of lock in the learning um, of that. And so as we start to think about uh, locking in the learning before we conclude today and take any questions that you may have, uh, I like to tell this story and it's something that some of you may have heard before, uh, but I, it requires visualization. So I want you to, uh, to visualize something. There is a professor standing in the front of a classroom and the professor is standing next to a table and there is a clear glass pitcher, P-I-T-C-H-E-R, vase, pitcher on the table. And he fills up that pitcher, that glass vase with big rocks. He puts as many in as he can. It's a pretty large vase, a pretty large pitcher. And he turns to the class and he says, is it full? And the class says, yes, you couldn't fit another rock in there. And so he just smiles, or in this case, she just smiles and pours in some smaller stones, some pebbles. And the pebbles fill the spaces that were created by the big rocks that he put in first. And he turns to the class again, or she turns to the class again and says, is the vase full now? And the class says, yeah, now it's completely full. The rocks are there, the pebbles have fit into the crevices that the rocks created, there's no more room. And so the professor just smiles and pours in sand. And the sand makes its way into all the little places where the rocks and the pebbles couldn't. And he fills it up to the top, pats it down, turns to the class and says, is it full now? And the class says, well, yeah, now it's really full. You couldn't fit anything else in there, especially when you packed it all down with the sand, it all drifted to the bottom and you kept on filling and now it's full. And so he takes two cups of coffee and he pours the coffee in. And of course, as you can visualize this, the sand absorbs the coffee. And the students are stymied at this point and they turn to him and say, well, okay, so what's the point? And he says, as you start to think about what's important to you, put the big rocks in first, put those things that are important to you in first, because if you first put in the sand and fill it to the top, you won't fit in any rocks. If you fill the vase with pebbles, with things that aren't that important to you, you won't fill in any rocks. Put the big rocks in first. And those big rocks are represented by that wheel of life. Put those in first and then fill in with the other things that are important. And inevitably there's a student in the back row who raises her hand and says, okay, we get that. What's with the coffee? And he says, well, you never wanna be so busy that you can't take the time to have a cup of coffee with a friend. And of course the class starts laughing, but the point is made. The point is to make sure that as you think about what you've learned today in terms of your brain type, your work style, your values and your wheel, what are the things that are the really big rocks? They will help you stay in the present. They will help you be that person who seems to get so much done and is still able to stay in the present by focusing on the things that are important. Um, so with that, I, I just wanna thank you for having me here. Um, and Bethany and Emily, if you have, if there's time to take questions, I'd be more than happy to answer any. 
Thank you, Karen, so much. Um, all right, so it is noon. So if you do have to leave us, we totally understand. But if you would like to stay around, feel free to um, raise your electronic hand if you have a question for Karen or anything that she's presented on today um, or a question that you have in relation to this topic of your brain type and your work styles. Um, but we just so appreciate you joining us today and we will ask questions if anyone um, has questions questions or is interested and we can start with one of the questions that we received prior is that um, people are wondering what are some strategies to balance being in the present you know you you speak about the the brain types and the work styles um, and you've already given us so much advice on you know what is that one thing that we're going to do next but what are some ways perhaps that are some strategies to balance being in the present reflecting to learn and that need to plan for the future yeah i think that's a great question and you know one of the answers can always be practicing meditation and i know that was one of the questions that came through before the session began that certainly is a is a practice that helps our brain stay more focused over time. But I think regardless of whether you're someone that wants to begin or continue a meditation practice, I think part of it is self-awareness. It's being aware of when you find yourself and your mind roaming from the present and, and bringing that back. It's, it literally requires self-management and to a certain extent, self-discipline, we all know when we're in the zone because when we're in the zone, time goes by in an instant. We're doing something that we love. It feels like we're just totally focused. When we find ourselves split and having that feeling of distraction or thinking of many, many things at once or worrying down a rat hole that's going nowhere, I think that's a question of saying, oh, I noticed myself doing that. I want to bring myself back. I want to be listening to the person that I'm talking with, really paying attention, or I want to be very focused on the task that I'm doing. Because what we do know is when we are doing repetitive tasks, whatever that might be, we can make mistakes if our mind isn't fully engaged in the present, no matter how repetitive it is. And so it's a question of being aware when our mind slips and saying, yeah, I, I know I'm thinking of that, but let me bring my mind back. Let me try to think about how I stay in the present with what I'm doing. Um, and then I'll think about that other thing next, whenever that present ends for me, whenever that time period ends for me. Hopefully that answers the question uh, that was asked. I'm sure it did. It definitely reminds us to be um, in the moment and mindful of, of what our priorities are. I'm not seeing any other questions or raised hands. So what I will do is share that, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of today's session, we'll send a follow-up email um, with a way that you can reach out to Karen directly if you wanna reach out and have any questions for her or be in touch. Um, additionally, we have more new year, new you, sessions this January. So definitely check out our listing of online events. We're so grateful that you make the time for us. And to you, Karen, thank you so much for making the time for us and preparing this presentation um, to kick off the new year and um, you know have our strategies for our whole health and be thinking about what we can do next. So thank you again. And thanks You're everyone. Most for welcome. Thank you. And thank you everyone for being here. I look forward to hearing thank from you, you if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Oh, we do have a question about the slides and a recording. Yes, we will provide those to everyone. If you're still on, we will be sending those along, the slides and a recording. All That's right, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.